Hello everyone, this is Katie, and we're going to get started in just a minute. And um, I'm going to ask you guys to do a, a brief introduction. We don't have a lot of time. We may not go get to all of the 20 ways, um, but we'll we'll get started here. Um, and it was a little confusing when you followed the link um, as to what to type in because it doesn't say enter your name, it says enter the name. <laughs> um, so a lot of people have been confused by that. But so the um, the person who is showing up as 20 ways, um, we'll start with you. If you could just grab the mic real quick and um, and then we'll continue down the list with a real quick introduction of who you are and where you work. Well, the 20 ways person, the literal one, is Sue Hines. I'm an adjunct with the elementary ed. I teach foundations and also supervise practicum and students and interns. And um, sorry, I just thought it was the name of the course I needed. Thank you. Hi, this is Adrian Thomas in Special Education, UAA. Hi, everyone. My name is Cindy Trussell. I am biology faculty down in Kodiak, and I am excited to pick up at least one, maybe ten, new things to do with the whiteboard in all my collaborate sessions. Hi, I'm Gina Tassos. I'm with the College of Adam in the Educational Leadership Department, and I'm teach a lot of online courses, so this is, I'm always looking for new ways and new ways to engage students and build that online community. Hi, I'm Heather Abina, and I'm an adjunct at Kodiak College and teaching accounting classes. And, uh, Lisa, maybe you're just listening in. Sorry, Lisa, I hope I didn't cut you off. Okay, so Lisa's listening and she's here at the College of Education as well. Um, so I'm an instructional designer at the College of Ed, and I'm so glad you guys are joining me today. Um, so, so Gina um, introduced this really well, and, um, and really we aren't doing anything spectacular at all. Everything that we're going to do is um, the things that you probably have done before in a traditional classroom with a chalkboard or a whiteboard or even an interactive whiteboard, because all of those active learning techniques can be um, adapted to using Collaborate because of this interactive whiteboard. So um, before we start going into all of the 20 ways, just to, I think all of you are familiar with the basic ways to communicate in Collaborate, and we are going to be concentrating on these tools on the side of the whiteboard since that's the focus of today's session. So we're going to definitely be using these top four a lot on almost every slide. We'll, we'll have one or two activities utilizing these next tools, and we won't really do too much with these last two tools. Um, however, there are some uh, folks in the College of Ed who find this screen capture to be pretty useful. I'm just in such a habit of using my own screen capture workflow that um, I don't use that a whole lot, but we will be talking about how useful um, bringing in a screen capture can be as opposed to um, maybe application sharing, which could use a lot more system resources. And it looks like Debbie joined us. Debbie, maybe a quick hello, please. As I rapidly switch from one task to another, hello, everybody. This is Debbie from Kodiak, and I'm an instructional designer and kind of helping out with some of these eTech Fair sessions. Great. Thank you for joining us. So um, this is our very first um, activity. What I'd like you to do is to, on, on this, um, grab the second tool there, pick any of the pointers that are available. Notice that the ones with the little triangles in the corner here um, do have multiple choices. But any of the, the pointers, and please mark yourself on this continuum. So this is the first way to use the whiteboard as a, as a knowledge probe just to get an idea about your audience. I really struggled with what order to put these in because many of them are useful 
when you're introducing something or useful when you are concluding something. So I really had a hard time putting these in order and I changed my mind a hundred times. But, but anyway, so this obviously um, could help the presenter know their audience. And when, you, when you've attended webinars, they typically ask a general question or two at the beginning for the same purpose. It's kind of anonymous. You could probably figure out who did what if you use the activity um, feed. But basically, you know, audience participants don't really know who, who wrote what. And, and we use this tool, um, the pointer tool, because everybody only has one. So it keeps people from, you know, marking multiple. Um, you'll notice if you try clicking somewhere else, it just moves yours over there. It doesn't allow you to do more than one. Whereas if you use some of the other tools on the toolbar, it would uh, allow you to, to mark in multiple places. Okay, so we have a wide range of experience in this group. And um, our next activity is going to be um, a brainstorm, but it's a brainstorm race because I'm going to turn on the timer. And what I'd like you to do I'm only going to give you a minute because we don't have a lot of time um, in this session. But basically, um, this is, again, a great way to, to start off a new topic to kind of find out what people already know. So um, could be, you know, similar to a KWL where you're starting off with what do people already know about this topic. So I'm going to ask you in what ways do you already use the whiteboard interactively. And what I'd like you to do is grab the, uh, the fourth tool down, which is the text tool. Now, there's two tools there. Um, I recommend using the one without the lines, just the regular A, because you're just going to be typing in a few words, whereas the one with the lines would be if you're going to be typing in a you know, whole paragraph. So um, once I start the timer, I want you to grab that fourth tool, the one uh, you have to click it once and then choose which of the two tools you want. And I'm suggesting you choose the second A tool, which is just the letter A. And um, thank you. And when the timer begins, um, just type as many ways that you can think of to use this whiteboard. And ready, set, go. As you continue, please continue to put ideas on there. And um, if, you're, if you're totally ignorant, that's great, because um, hopefully you'll learn a lot today. Um, so the other thing you could do is if you really wanted to, if you had a large group, you could divide them into actual teams and have people use different colors. You guys, some of you have already done that. Um, or you could even put a line down the middle and, and divide it up that way if it was really going to be a race. Um, so the timer has about 12 seconds left. Left. These are all really great ideas and some of the ones that we are going to practice in this interactive session today. Um, I, I'm going, I am starting, okay, the timer is up. Um, I am starting at a basic level because um, there are some more advanced things you can do, but we're starting with kind of what I said at the beginning, which is basically adapting things that you um, have used in a face-to-face -face setting. Okay, so thank you for participating in this, um, and we're going to go on to the next one, which is similar. This is group note-taking. Now, I know many of you have um, done this before, because I know some of you, and um, it can be done with either of the text tools. However, in our particular case today, just to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stick with the same tool, which is, again, the fourth tool down on the, on the left side. So um, when you're looking over to the left of the whiteboard here, the fourth one down, um, if you click it and then choose just the regular A tool, um, what we're going to do with this activity is I'm going to just ask for volunteers. As, I'm going to go over some basics and some tips for this presentation in general using the whiteboard interactively, some things to think about. And what I'd like volunteers to to please do is when I say something that you think might be useful to remember, just go ahead and, and type it up there on the screen using the, the, one of the text tools, the fourth tool down. So please just go ahead and do that as I'm going to start going over some general tips and tricks. So um, obviously the, the goal today is to share ways. I'm going to give you guys a chance um, to share some ways or brainstorm some different uh, ideas for some of the things I've come up with. And um, 
how to use the whiteboard interactively. And as you all know, it's really important for um, students in an online class session like this to have um, something that they're doing besides listening um, in order to stay engaged. And um, there is something technically called an enhanced lecture. And that's when it, you plan a series of mini lectures and then you have a specific active learning event in there maybe every six, ten minutes or something like that. So it's all planned um, and that's kind of what we're going for here. Some of these ideas can be what you'll do for those active learning events. Um, so the way that you design your slides is really don't be afraid to create a slide like I just did here. I mean, obviously, it's very simple to create with just the title. And this uh, allows for that interaction, in, interaction. If you create all bullet list slides, it doesn't really um, give the students any space to, to add anything to the whiteboard. So it all boils down to how you design your slides, thinking about engaging students. Um, so a couple of tips about that. You guys probably all know that PowerPoint uploads really easily into Collaborate. You probably also know that it converts PowerPoint slides into flat images. So that if you had some animations or something interactive built into the PowerPoint, it wouldn't actually be interactive once it was brought into Collaborate, such as a hyperlink. So um, that's one thing to be aware of. You can, of course, do hyperlinks a number of other ways by putting them onto the slide after you've uploaded the PowerPoint slide or putting it into chat or using a whiteboard file, which we're not going to talk much about because it's a little bit more advanced. Another important thing to remember is that if you're going to be using this, you're going to want to probably save some of the valuable content that is created by your students. So do be aware that you can save this great information beyond just the recording. So if you guys all wanted to um, take a look at the file menu, there, participants can do it as well. If you go to File Save, notice there is File Save Whiteboard. Um, and there are a couple of different formats. And so it, that, again, gives you a whole lot of other things you can do with it because you could ask the students at the beginning of the course to brainstorm some things and then you could actually bring that back and show that to them towards the end of the semester say these are the things you said you know and maybe they could compare um, how they feel at the end of the semester with what they said in some kind of a interactive activity like this at the beginning of the semester. Um, another really important thing to keep in mind is that while we do have a, a nice mobile app for iPads um, for Collaborate, it doesn't allow the interaction with the whiteboard. And I know Cindy and probably some other of you have just worked around it by having students put information into chat that they would normally put onto the whiteboard. Um, and uh, in the College of Ed, we also typically just recommend the students use it only as a plan B where they can get a lot more out of it if they attend on their computer. And one last tip I want to remind you of is that when you're going to be spending a lot of time creating some of these um, interactive slides in PowerPoint, keep in mind that there is a limit to how much you can upload into Collaborate. Some of our faculty members run into that uh, every once in a while when they have um, lots and lots of um, images and that kind of stuff. And I can share some tricks for that. One is, of course, to compress the um, pictures and make them lower resolution, um, and that will make the size of the PowerPoint smaller and upload easier. There are a couple of other workarounds. Okay, so this is group note taking, and so this is something that may be easier done in, in some other ways, but it is one possible idea for using the whiteboard. So any comments you want to add? I know a lot of you already have quite a bit of experience using Collaborate with those basic things that I just went over, tips, any other tips and tricks? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Google Docs is a little bit slicker. I do have multiple talkers um, turned on, so you, even if I am talking, you should um, be able to grab the mic so you can please jump in at any time we're, we're doing this pretty informally. 
Um, so going to the next idea, this one's kind of fun. We're going to use, the, again, that second tool on the toolbar. This is kind of a fun map because it shows the United States uh, from, the, from our perspective up here in Alaska <laughs> and the little lower 48 down at the bottom. Um, and um, so what I'd like you to do is grab one of those pointers, um, such as the laser pointer, and um, indicate on this map where you grew up. So this is a very common type of icebreaker activity. And again, I'm having you use the second tool on the toolbar because it allows one per person. And it's somewhat anonymous, but it just kind of gives us an idea of um, the makeup of the participants or students. Um, so can you guys think, this is just one example, I've general, generically called this image indicators. Can you think of some other images where it could be used in one of your classes that you would put on a slide that, ever, that a student or multiple students could indicate something on? Um, this isn't my class, but I've seen, I've heard Sue Bowie do it with um, anatomy and physiology things, so she'll put up images and then have people identify muscles or bones or all sorts of different things, and I've done it, I've done it, but I'm trying to think of what I've done it with, but, you know, making sure that people see what you're talking about. Oh, I know, I've done it with clumped distributions of humans and uniform distribution of humans, and I have this map that I show and I have them circle different things. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to use, to use image, image indicators. I like the title. Yeah, and I actually have quite a few ideas for images that are, that all are kind of similar. So maybe I maybe I cheated by by saying there's 20 different ideas because the next couple ones all relate to images. So this one I call check for understanding, and this might fit along the lines more with what you, Cindy and Gina, are talking about. So taking some kind of a data. Uh, some kind of a chart, graph, in this case I have an infographic, and, and maybe asking a student to, you know, to check for understanding, um, asking for a volunteer to, to explain it or describe it. Um, this is a technique that um, a lot of our faculty members use to just make sure that people are paying attention and understand what um, the content they just finished going over or whatever. Um, so you could just, you know, have one student kind of explain the graphic and, um, of course, they would be encouraged to use these tools as they go through the pointer tool. You guys can grab that if you want to play around with that a little bit. And, oh, good, ideally. Um, so, yeah, any kind of graph and or you could have the students um, use maybe the, the third tool which is either a highlighter or a pen, and they could actually, you know, circle which one they think is the most uh, challenging for them personally, and then grab the mic and say why, or the of any of the shape tools. So you can um, use images, as I said, in many different ways. So this is just, I was thinking of this more as a, as a more technical, I guess, putting something up here that people would have to um, explain, so going along with using the microphone. So here's another image one, and this one is an observation image. Now, I realize this is geared towards education, and, and some of, many of us are in the College of Education, but this um, was something I just read online. I've never actually used it, but basically, um, it, they said in face-to-face -face settings, if you go to a really busy, complicated place and have everybody write down observations for a certain amount of time and then come back and share, it could be an interesting icebreaker activity. So um, uh, if you tried to adapt that to online, you could have a, a kind of a complex photo like I have here that I found on Flickr, and then you could ask um, everybody, you could um, you know, set the timer and everybody um, take notes in silence for five minutes about what they observe, you know, with absolutely no restrictions, and then ask uh, for people to share what things they noticed. Uh, uh, you know, in this case, I've, I've done an education photo, obviously. Um, and so this kind of goes along with using the chat. I just wanted to ask you, I haven't, again, haven't done this, but do you think it would work if you had people type in their observations in the chat 
Um, and then when the timer went off, hit enter, and then everybody's observations would um, would show up. So I don't know if you think that do you think that would work. So again, kind of comparing some of the the different things, I, I pointed out to you that an activity like this is somewhat anonymous. Nobody really knows who are the experienced people and who aren't. And so when you do something like this, again, kind of anonymous, um, but when you are asking them to put into chat something, then it's obviously not anonymous. So just wanted to point that out. You could think about that as you're um, deciding how you want to do your activities and, um, you know, whether it would make a difference if people had the, you know, people might be more, I guess, comfortable if, if it wasn't attached to their name, maybe. I don't know. Okay, and um, that's right. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier is um, under the, uh, when you're a moderator, there is um, under the window menu something called show activity, and, and it does allow you to see exactly who's doing what. So that's why I said it's kind of anonymous. Um, so I have, as I said, quite a few um, ideas for images. Um, so moving on to um, this one. Now this is one that um, works a little differently on a Mac and a PC. So, uh, and it does take a little bit more skill from your participants. Um, so what this is, is basically you're telling the participants to go find some images and bring them and put them onto the slide because the Collaborate whiteboard allows you to paste. So you can, um, thank you. So I want you guys to do that. I was going to give you a, a theme. One of my favorites for this activity is book covers. So often as an icebreaker, what, what book are you reading right now or what's your favorite book? And some of our faculty members could even use it with, um, you know, go find a, a book from the Consortium Library website and, you know, copy the cover of the book and paste it here. So if you would like to try that, on a PC, believe it or not, you can actually drag and drop, I know who put that book there, you can actually drag and drop from the, um, the internet. And so if you opened, you know, Amazon.com or or went to the library or whatever. If you're on a PC, it does allow you to just drag and drop a, a book cover. And um, if you're not, or you aren't able to do that for whatever reason, then just a copy paste. So what I have heard from Mac users is that um, it works best if you um, actually in Collaborate, go to the edit menu and choose paste from the menu at the top, that then it seems to work better. Um, I understand, again, from Mac users that it doesn't work to drag and drop. Is that correct for you Mac users out there? I just used drag and drop, and it worked out fine. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. I dragged and dropped from my desktop. You drag and drop from your desktop, is that what you said? Yes, I did. Perfect. Okay. So this is also an opportunity for us to try that very top tool on the on the toolbar. So on the on the toolbar again over here on the left side of your screen, the very top tool. Go ahead and grab that tool, and um, this is how you move things around. So go ahead and feel free to drag a couple of these books and evenly space them. This is also how you can resize. So if your book came out a little too big or a little too small, you can make them um, a different size. And so that tool is really useful and good to be comfortable with because when you're having a whole bunch of people populate this whiteboard at the same time, it's bound to have some overlap. And so being the nice thing is you can drag other people. It's not just your own that you can drag. So you might have a neat freak in the group. I won't name any names here in this group, but who wants to align them all in a perfect row, for example. And they would be able to do that um, even though they didn't put that item on the whiteboard. So again, just uh, grab the mic or type in chat. Do you have any other thoughts? Um, I, as I said, I usually use book covers. What other ideas do you have for having students find some images to share? I've, I've done an icebreaker where we put like um, an animal we feel like 
or a food. We did food one time. You know, because when you're when you're in a collaborate session, everyone's having a snack, so we can do virtual snacks and put them all up on the whiteboard. Great idea. And if you want people to identify, then you can also have them grab the text tool and type their name under the one they put there. If you're using it as a, a way to get to know each other, that would be obviously pretty important um, to know who put what there. And you know, we're we're on a quick time frame here, but or go through um, and have people use the microphone to introduce themselves and say you know what book cover they put there and why. Of course, so we're we're doing the abbreviated version. <laughs> okay, so once again, remember that. Um, this, you know, will be in the recording in your class if you use this activity. But if it is something pretty important, you can also go and save this this individually in a number of different formats: um, PDF format as an image or as a whiteboard format. The advantage of saving it as a whiteboard file is that it would remain interactive if you loaded it into a future collaborate session as a WDB whiteboard file. Then it will remain so that you can keep keep moving these around, whereas obviously if you saved it as an image or a PDF, then it is just a flat image and can no longer be manipulated like we're, we're doing now by moving things around. Okay, so any other comments on this before we move on to uh, one more image activity? I was just going to say, I used it once in a scavenger hunt where we were looking for symptoms of different um, vitamin deficiencies, and I asked people to go find an image of an enlarged heart, and so we used it as, a, as part of that process. That's, that's a great idea. I was really trying to think of some more academic ideas for this activity. Um, and that um, kind of is a perfect segue into this, which you mentioned earlier, Cindy. Um, we, do, we definitely have some people in the College of Ed who do some um, brain things. Um, so why don't you uh, science people out there um, see if you can label some of these that don't. Some of them have labels. And you'll notice there are some lines at the top and at the bottom left that do not have labels. If you would grab the A tool, again, I'd recommend the one without the lines, just the regular A tool. Do you know what some of those parts of the brain are? And if so, can you label them for us? I can give you a couple of hints, because I wrote down the answers. Uh, one of these is the cerebellum. And one of them is the olfactory bulb. Yes, Gina. And one of them is the central sulcus, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Uh, one of them is the postcentral gyrus. I like that brain label. That's a good one. Yeah. And and I guess another thing is if you had put the labels down below there, we could have done some matching thing. Depends on whether you want us to recall or um, remember. Exactly. And actually, matching is another one of mine. This is labeling. Um, but that she brings up a good point. Um, if you were to do that, you would want to um, you would want to do it ahead of time and save it as a whiteboard file if you put those words at the bottom so that people could drag and drop them. So that is something you could definitely do. Um, I hadn't really covered it exactly like you're saying, Lee, so you don't need to say, whoops, I'm just, um, I had matching done a slightly different way. Um, but anyway, yes, you could, you could definitely have floating words on here that people could drag into position. And I probably should have done that for this activity since it is a little bit hard since we haven't actually been studying the brain. <laughs> okay, so here is another one. And this is, a, a, again, a very easy slide to design. But now we're going to go back and um, try some of the um, tools on the, on the toolbar there that we haven't used. Um, yet, which are these tools down here. Um, so the shape tools and the line tools, we have, we'll also use the text tool um, for this activity. But um, what I'd like you to, to think about just, just as a practice is um, 
maybe we could draw a little concept map of all of the UAA um, core technology tools, so the UAA systems. Um, so, for example, you could um, draw a shape, and inside that shape you could put in, um, you know, something like, you know, one of the core technology tools is um, Microsoft Outlook, something like that. And you could use line tools. There is a line tool, and then it could, um, you know, make connections. So Microsoft Outlook might connect to Microsoft Link and, and so on. Um, you can, by the way, change colors. So in, you could definitely use colors for indicators. So you have a black oval. You can change, um, you can choose the, the text tool, and then you could actually pick white text or yellow text like someone has done there. So you can really do quite a bit. And if you have a large group, it would be probably more useful to do an activity like this in breakout rooms with smaller groups of people. And um, and giving them plenty of time, they could actually create something pretty nice. Um, and then, like Lee suggested before, you could, and I've done this for somebody in the College of Ed, create a whiteboard file that had all these individual shapes, and then the students would just drag them into the correct process or flow chart or whatever. Um, so it, you could make it a little bit easier instead of having them start from nothing. So can you think of some other things that this might work for? You know, I can't think of a specific activity off the top of my head, but being able to do concept maps or mind maps is a, is a good thing. Um, so, um, and, and it also means people can learn about grouping. So like my blackboard sticks together, but the collaborate it doesn't, so, um, you know, there's some deve developmental stuff that happens with using the whiteboards. Yes, indeed. The whiteboard definitely, again, when you click on that top tool on the toolbar, um, you can right-click and find quite a few additional options um, because there, there really are quite a few options. Most people don't use a whole lot. And um, screenshots, thank you for whoever put that screenshot there. So again, if you were going to save this whiteboard and want to continue to be able to manipulate it, you would want to save it um, with that whiteboard format as opposed to a PDF or a, a PNG. But if it was something that was just done and you just wanted to save it as an artifact of some kind, then, then, then a, um, a PNG, the advantage of that is that it does load very easily into another Blackboard session because it's an image file, whereas a PDF um, would be something you want to use um, and share outside of Collaborate because, you know, a PDF doesn't uh, directly um, load into Collaborate. Okay, great idea. So moving along to number 10, we're, we're only about halfway through, so we're going to probably not get through all of these, but um, this is basically just a, a structured um, slide with a, with a table created. And so um, you could pose a question and ask every person to write their answer um, in one of these squares. So, um, you know, you could count off by raising your hands, for example. That would number everybody. If, you know, I could number these ahead of time. or one of our faculty members actually only has um, six students, and she puts this up as the first slide every week and has the students do that as a check-in. So basically every student, um, you know, just picks a box, and they just write a, a couple of things that they've done that week. Um, and it, again, it works with a small class, but maybe not so much with a, with a big class. So, so just for practice here, why don't you use the A tool, the text tool, and you could type in one of these squares um, how about your favorite holiday food, just for fun? Did you say favorite holiday or favorite holiday food? Favorite holiday food, meaning favorite, I should have said favorite winter holiday food. Again, it's not necessary to have a table to do this kind of activity, but sometimes putting a little more structure, I have found, um, makes the students 
a little less afraid because sometimes if you give them just a blank slide, they don't know where you want them to type. And so doing it this way, for whatever reason, sometimes allows students to feel a little more comfortable and clearly know, oh, I'm supposed to type in one of those squares. Um, so Cindy, that is a great idea. Um, so basically any kind of sign. Darn it, I was just talking with my talk, uh, talking without my, my mic on. But um, so some structure sometimes helps students feel a little more comfortable rather than starting with an empty slide. They might feel a little bit more comfortable knowing where they can, where they can add their words. Um, okay, so again, we are going to move on to, um, this is again something that, a uh, good idea, Leah, uh, putting names or numbers in the boxes to assign them to people. Um, you could also have avatars as well. Um, so this is a, a kind of a Likert scale kind of slide, and we actually have a faculty member who who often uses this by putting um, these options in the corner. So what I'd like you to do is to grab that second tool on the side of the whiteboard, which is the pointer tool, and pick any of those laser pointers and go ahead and answer this, whatever you feel right now. So this slide could be used over and over again. Um, the moderator could clear the page, could actually, you know, not put the sentence in there, clear the page each time and just, um, you know, say out loud a, a comment or whatever. And that way this slide could just be continually reused. But again, it's just giving the, the students a chance to, um, to do some kind of interaction and, um, I forget what the faculty member who uses this, she calls it something else, but I, I called it Likert scale. But again, easy to create by just using smart art in PowerPoint. And I find smart art to be a really useful tool um, for creating things for, for Collaborate. Okay, here's another similar activity um, with a very simple slide design. This is could be done with a two-column method like you see here, a T-chart, or it could be done like a KWL, which I mentioned before, another kind of graphic organizer. KWL stands for Know, Want to Know, and Learned. So students fill out the No column for what they already know, the, the W column for what they want to know, and the L column for what they've learned at the end of an activity. In this case, I, I simplified and, and chose the two-column method, which could be anything. So in this case, I'll let you go ahead if you want to write a couple of words um, under, you know, what does passive learning look like? What does active learning look like? You can use the A tool to add some ideas up on the whiteboard. And, um, but this could have, you know, advantages and disadvantages, similarities and differences. Um, and uh, some other ideas that I found online that I haven't done myself include maybe asking half the room, assigning half the room to you know, the left side and have to the right side instead of letting them pick, um, you know, forcing forcing them to to be on a certain side. Um, hi, Rhonda. Thanks for joining us. Did you want to um, say something? Um, so, Rhonda, I just saw that your hand is up, so I thought maybe you wanted to say something. If you do, you can just grab the, the talk button. Uh, no, I just joined, sorry. Okay, no problem. So we were just looking at this, um, this is idea number 12, which is a, a T-chart, it could be two columns, could be three columns. Um, but this really just is kind of, again, something that you could either use at the beginning to start thinking about a new topic, or it could be used at the end to um, review a topic and, um, and basically, just basically information gathering and thinking, you know, taking a topic and a little bit farther, I guess. Okay, so moving on, thank you for, um, <laughs> thank you for um, participating in this one. We're 
Going on to number 13, this one I just thought it would be kind of funny, but Lee, this is, this is what I considered um, matching. And I was thinking that people would actually grab either the line tool or the pen or the highlighter tool. So, that, so on the left side of your whiteboard, the, the pen or highlighter tool um, is the third one down. And the line tool is the seventh one down. So if you'd like to guess what these stand, these, um, these uh, funny terms that you've heard the students use, internet slang, what is the correct definition? And there's probably more than one, but I've given you a couple choices. So, Cindy, I see your comment. Um, would you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So, with your T format, um, we had this three. We were having trouble getting the students to connect the ideas of science, technology, and culture, and how they cross influenced each other. So, we took one of our readings and we asked them to just list all the things they could think of that had to do with science, and then all the things they could think of that had to do with technology, and all the things that they could think of that had to do with culture from that particular reading. And then we actually asked that they sit back and read through those, and then try, And then we asked them to grab the mic and talk about how they could see a connection between all three, because we were having trouble with them doing that. That is an excellent idea. Thank you for, for sharing that application of the, this previous one using columns. OK, so number 14 is show and tell. And show and tell really could be anything. But basically, the idea is that um, you assign a student um, you have to do some kind of an opening activity. And we, this came about just in meeting with a couple of faculty and saying how great it would be to have some kind of an opening activity that would really encourage the students to log in, in you know, on time or early so that there, were, you know, there was something for them to do if they, some kind of reward for getting there early or on time. But how much work that could be for the instructor. And so possibly thinking of the old show and tell, assigning a different student each class period, they have to prepare something for show and tell, and they have to be there early and put something on the whiteboard or, you know, share a current event on the whiteboard, um, a link to an article, some kind of image, inspiration, quote, um, or even just maybe one quick uh, multiple choice question from the reading or something like that. So show and tell is pretty wide open. Do you guys have any um, thoughts about that as an opening activity for each class meeting? So I used to teach um, digital design, and um, so because that was very visual, we actually always did show and tell, and it was totally voluntary. People weren't assigned, but that way people could just grab images of, you know, advertisements or other designs that they like, and then share it on the whiteboard and say what they liked about it. So we, so I've used that one quite a bit. Um, this one is a really simple one. Um, if you have PowerPoint slides that you have created and you want to go through and redesign them with interaction in mind, this is a real easy <laughs> way to change a slide. And that's just picking something to leave out, <laughs> um, so making it into a fill-in-the-blank slide. So taking out some vital piece of information so that the students have to think about it and discuss it and um, somebody could just um, write in a guess and then they could talk about that person's guess. Um, so Again, instead of having all your bullet lists, maybe just trying to um, leave a few blanks for people to think about. OK, so I know that I'm going through this pretty quickly, but we're supposed to be finishing up here soon. And we're only on number 16. Um, so I'm going to just kind of gloss over this. Obviously, many of the things we've already talked about can be used in breakout rooms. Um, but I did do a little searching for some um, for some other thoughts. Um, who is 20 ways? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's Sue Hine. She, I didn't know what you meant. She's one of the adjuncts here. Um, she did introduce herself I think, before you joined. Anyway, um, so Having students write test questions is one idea. Corners is an activity where you actually 
um, mark the option for students to be able to move themselves into two rooms. And then, you know, like you do when you go to a regular face-to-face -face workshop and somebody puts those big post-it things on four places in the room and you all walk around and add things to the list? So you could do that. Um, in breakout rooms by going into the breakout rooms at a time and posting a couple of, you know, one question in each room, letting the students move themselves from room to room, participating on all of them. So again, just taking that standard face-to-face -face activity and adapting it to collaborate uh, works in, in many cases. Um, so I've got a few other ideas here. Um, you know, writing instructions is pretty obvious. Three, two, one is just after, again, after a mini lecture that a small group writes together, writes three, three ideas presented, two examples or applications, and one unresolved question or something like that. So again, just a little more structured to um, after a mini lecture. And then listening teams is where you actually assign people roles and then they have to um, listen for certain things. So there could be agreeers, naysayers, and appliers, and then they, they're put into those breakout rooms where they can, they can discuss based on what they listened to when they had a certain uh, lens that they were thinking through as they listened to the mini lecture. Okay, so um, I know that some of the people in this room have done a student bio slide, and this is something that you tell the students ahead of time to each submit just one PowerPoint slide with um, whatever they want on it. And of course, there's a million other applications. This is more of a first day of class introductions. And I know some of you have done this before. But um, I'm going to take that one step farther uh, here. And have you ever changed that into a gallery walk? So if they were putting some um, something else on their on their slide, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bio slide. Or if you created a variety of slides like this particular example, then what I can do is I can uncheck follow. So right now I've just unchecked follow. So do you guys see arrows at the top where you can now change slides? So everybody can independently go from slide to slide, looking through the slides, participating in different slides. And so, yeah, like Lee said, either the students could have created the different slides, and, and I put them all together and put them in here as the instructor, or the instructor could create a, a variety of slides. Um, but, the, but really the key is, is when you are looking at um, uh, your little page explorer or the way that you change slides as a moderator, there is a little follow button. And if you, if you uncheck the follow button, that allows your participants to move through the slides automatically. So some people have only found that out by mistake when they didn't mean to uncheck follow and then they've noticed, hey, how come nobody's looking at the same slide I am? So the, when you're a moderator, there is a little red outline around the outside and that's supposed to clue you in that um, your students aren't necessarily looking at the same slide that you are. And so, yeah, I think everybody's done that before. And so then you could set the timer and, you know, the timer is a nice thing because then, then people have an idea of how long they can spend looking at these different things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn follow off, or I'm sorry, turn it back on, I should say. So now um, I'm back in control, controlling what you see because we are almost uh, finished here. And um, I want you to take a minute because this is, is a concluding activity here. I want you to just list from the things we talked about, which of the ones you want to try to um, implement. Just go ahead and grab one of the text tools and please add to this slide. And uh, this is, we have one more after this, but we're, we're basically done. And, I, and uh, yeah, so grab the text tool. Again, which of the things that we talked about are ones that you think you want to try to remember? And by the way, um, in chat, Gina asked if, if um, I would share this PowerPoint presentation. I would definitely be happy to. Um, and I know all of you, um, except for, um, well, I guess um, Heather, Rhonda, and Val, if you could put your email addresses in chat if you'd like me to email you this PowerPoint presentation. Um, the rest of you guys, I have your email addresses.
one of the things I just did um, behind the scenes was I, I used screenshot, and I wanted to mention that because being comfortable with taking screenshots is useful in many different ways, um, especially when you're describing something to somebody and, you know, you're trying to point it out. Being able to take a screenshot of a website and quickly um, paste it onto the whiteboard. In this case, I just took a screenshot uh, of the participant list, but that is a skill that everybody needs to use. It comes in handy so many different um, times. Um, okay, so our very last number 20 is really, uh, we're going to come back to this 19 to do it, but basically, um, once you have done a brainstorm or a listing activity, um, then obviously you can take that top tool on the toolbar and you can, um, um, thank you for that screenshot. That's a perfect example. It's just so easy and quick. Um, we're going back to the screenshot thing because um, application sharing, we find, really takes a lot of system resources. So we really avoid it whenever possible. And uh, a lot of times, you can just grab a screenshot to point something out. Um, so going back to our number 20, which was rank, categorize, or prioritize, you could then, after you've had your students list or brainstorm, you could then have them put them all in, in priority priority order. So I'm going to just drag this uh, photo down just a little bit so we can see all the, it, the um, entries. And if you click on that top tool, see how we can remember, to, we can just drag these all. So if, if anybody would like to um, put them in some kind of a order, we could also, you know, make them into three um, columns or whatever we want to do with them. It's nice when they're still on there and you can you can move them around to um, be able to rank, categorize, and prioritize. Okay, so um, we are um, over our time just a little bit, and I'm sorry that I probably should have, I was a little too ambitious, I should have done 15 ways, but there's just so many um, ways, and I, I had to limit myself to 20. I actually started off naming it 25, <laughs> but I reduced it to 20. I should have done 15. Okay, so I'm going to open the mic and ask um, for some other thoughts from you guys. I, I'm going to go ahead and post the um, evaluation, but please go ahead and grab the, the uh, microphone and share some other thoughts. I want to know what number 20 is. Number 20, I, I just put up there really quick, sorry, because it really went back to taking number 19 and ranking them, categorizing them, or prioritizing them. Sorry about that. 